I'm William Michael of the Classical Liberal Arts Academy, and uh, today in the church calendar, it's Trinity Sunday. So uh, normally on Trinity Sunday, uh, priests are challenged with the task of, of dealing with uh, scripture readings at Mass that, that address the, uh, the Trinity. Today we, we read uh, the Great Commission. I think, it's, I think it's from Matthew chapter 28. Um, I'm not sure if it's the same passage from another one of the Gospels, but uh, in, the, in, in the Great Commission, we see Jesus sending his disciples into the world, and he tells them to baptize in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And that passage is presented to us on Trinity Sunday because it contains uh, the name of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, normally, we get this sort of silly, jokey talk about how, you know, we're going to try to talk about the Trinity, and it's a mystery, and nobody can understand it, and, and so on. And that's really not true. Um, it's really not true. It, it, it's no more true that we can't understand the Trinity than anything else about God. We understand God through similitudes. We understand God, you know, um, vaguely, but but really uh, through comparisons, comparisons with, with his works, with things that are made. And uh, the extent to which we devote ourselves to the study of, of philosophy and theology, our knowledge of God becomes clearer and clearer. And it, it wouldn't make any sense to make the doctrine of the Trinity really the, the fundamental doctrine of the Christian faith. And then when someone asks for an explanation, we all joke and say, you know, there's no way really to understand it. If, if that's true, then, then it wouldn't make any sense for it to be necessary to be believed. Uh, and it's a big deal. The doctrine of the Trinity is serious. Jews, for example, uh, believe that Christians are idolaters because they worship more than one God. They know that in the Old Testament, Moses said, the Lord thy God, he is one. And now here we have Christians talking about God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And Jews say, look, save all your baloney. You're, you're, you're basically polytheists. You're idolaters. Uh, so this is a big deal. And, and imagine a Jew, you know, hearing a Christian talk about the Trinity or hearing a Christian profess, you know, the Apostles' Creed. Imagine a Jew asking, what exactly do you mean when you say that, you know, the, the, the God is, you know, one being in three persons? What does that actually mean to get these dumb, silly answers from Christian people? It'd be pretty ridiculous, especially when the Jews are accusing Christians of, of idolatry. Um, we, can't, we can't act like this central, foundational doctrine of the Christian faith really can't be explained. If, if that was true, uh, it wouldn't make much sense to, you know, to be willing to, to fight and die for it, as people have done in church history. So what I'd like to do today is talk a little bit about the Trinity, because the, the concept you know, the concepts on which the doctrine are based, they're really not that complicated. They're, they're primarily philosophical, though, and when we say they can't be understood or explained, usually that's, a, that's an admission that we simply have not studied scholastic philosophy as we're supposed to. So maybe in, you know, 1000 AD, 600 AD, maybe it would have made sense to sort of stumble uh, when talking about the Trinity, but in 2024 AD, 800 years after St. Thomas explained this in the Summa Theologica, it's just a sign of a neglect of study rather than any, you know, sincere effort to understand some profound mystery. Um, it's not that mysterious because God has revealed it to us and um, with the help of, of philosophy and the work of, of you know, great great men like uh, Thomas Aquinas, we, we can explain the doctrine of the Trinity, but there are usually some, some problems in the way we think that get in the way and cause us to stumble on these things. And we've got to clear those things up, then establish a couple simple ideas, and I think the doctrine of the Trinity becomes pretty, pretty simple to understand. Um, certainly much more simple than, than just pretending we should believe it in the dark with no understanding. 
That's certainly not to be expected. So anyway, when we talk about the problems, and bear with me because these talks are not um, prepared lectures or scripted. Um, I, I try to keep them as, as conversational and simple as possible. But when we talk about God, we usually fall into common mistakes because we, 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 we think of God in terms of ourselves. And when we talk about God, this is a little complicated, when we talk about God, we talk about God with language that comes from our worldly experience, from our human experience. We use words to talk about God that, that don't necessarily um, describe God as he truly is, but everything we say about God is through similitudes. It's, it's by comparisons, by, by comparing and contrasting God to other things. So we can say, for example, that, that God is good, and we think of a good man, what, what a good man would be, and then we say, well, God is, God is more good than a good man, and, and we, we, we can get something of a conception of what God might be like. We could say, man, some men are very powerful. God is, God is more powerful. And we get an idea of God by comparison. We could say, man is deceitful. God is not deceitful. So by contrasting, we can you know, clarify some thoughts about God. And that's pretty much how we think and talk about God, by, by comparisons and contrasts with 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 things that we perceive in the world. But that's really limited, and we get to some things where we've got to be careful when we make comparisons because the comparisons don't really work. For example, uh, as human beings or as any, any animal, uh, created animal in the world, we're bodily creatures. We have bodies. We're finite. We're limited. We, we have to work according to certain laws of nature, we might say. We're, we're controlled and, and constrained by our physical bodies and by the relative weakness of those bodies in the presence of such a vast natural world. There's only so much we can do. We can dig the earth, for example, move the earth one shovel at a time, um, unless we you know, build some machinery and things like that. But we're finite. We're limited in strength. We're limited in knowledge to what we have perceived and experienced. So we have limitations, and all of those limitations reside primarily in our bodies. So when we think about God, if we take any bodily thoughts and apply them to God, we get a, a perverted view of what, of what God might be like. And many times when we, when we hear a word or think of God, think of something we learn about God, we, we think of it in terms of bodies, and that screws things up. So we've got to be really careful that we don't think about God as existing in a body. He's not like the great sky daddy, some, some grandfather sitting up high in the heavens, this old man uh, with a body who has you know, an address in the universe and does things by some superhuman strength or superhuman um, physical power or intelligence. That's, that's not what God is. God is infinite. He is he is not bodily. He is a spirit. And so we've really got to begin by making sure we think of God as an infinite spirit, invisible, immovable, eternal, unchangeable, and so on. He is an infinite spirit. We are finite physical creatures composed of body and soul, finite limited. Our knowledge is limited. Our power is limited, and so on. God is infinite, omnipotent, all-powerful, omniscient, all-knowing, and so on. Eternal uh, is another important quality. But most importantly, he is a spirit. That's the most important thing for us to really focus on God is spirit. God is a spirit. He is not a bodily creature. So we should never think of anything bodily with respect to God. And when we read things in Scripture like, like um, you know, the Lord sees us or the Lord was walking in the garden or God's right hand is powerful, 
and these sorts of bodily references, those are just figurative expressions. They're just figurative. None of those things are meant to be understood literally. When we think of God, we have to, we have to remind ourselves that he is an infinite spirit, an infinite spirit. He is an intellectual being. So if we think of ourselves as composites of body and soul, if we think of the body uh, as our physical existence, right, in space and time, and then if we think of our, our intellect as something, you know, sort of, it has no mass, it, it doesn't really, you know, have a, have a location, um, it can exist after our bodies die, and, and so on. Um, if we think about ourselves as a, as a composite of body and soul, God is not like our body. There is likeness between man and God because we were created in the image of God. There's, there's, there's likeness. Um, but that likeness is not based on our existence bodily. That, that likeness is intellectual. That likeness is spiritual. And so it, it, we almost need to, to separate ourselves and sort of get rid of our bodily existence and think just of our intellectual or spiritual existence. And if we're going to think of, of, of God and make comparisons, we should try to limit those comparisons to, to, to our spiritual nature rather than our bodily nature. So when we talk about the Trinity, for example, and we start talking about God being one, many people start thinking about one body, one you know, God is one, one man. He's, he's sky daddy up in heaven. He is the great grandfather that's, you know, depicted in paintings and things like that. Big gray beard, gray hair, old man, you know, like, like the Greek Zeus, right? Um, so we think of God as a body. And, and that's the first thing. We have to stop that. We have to, we have, first, we have to realize that God is an infinite spirit, an invisible spirit, omnipresent present everywhere. So we've got to start with that. And even if we can't really comprehend that in, in any kind of material way, we can't compare it to anything because anything we would compare it to would be finite. So you can't make a comparison between something infinite and something finite. That's, that's the difficulty. But we first have to stop thinking about God in terms of a body or a place or a location and so on. He's not just a bigger, stronger, better man than human beings. He is an infinite spirit. He's an intellectual being. He's invisible. He has no body. He has no top, bottom, front, back, left, right. He is invisible. He's an infinite spirit, and he is he's intellectual in nature. Think about that. He's intellectual in nature. We might compare him to a mind or a soul, okay? Now, when we talk about the Trinity, we say that God is one in being, um, but he exists as three persons. And again, when we think of persons, we normally think of three, three men, right? We think of Peter, James, and John. Three men, they have separate bodies, and we say, there's person number one, that's Peter. There's person number two, that's James. And over there, that's person number three, that's John you know, person one, person two, person three, body one, body two, body three. Um, but again, God is not a body. So when we talk about the persons in God, we're, we're not talking about separate bodies. So, so get all of that bodily, uh, that bodily uh, talk and language and, and all of those ideas, just get that out of your mind because we're not talking about a bodily being. We're talking about an immaterial infinite spirit, invisible, doesn't have a body. Now, when we talk about God and we say that God is one, we mean that the divine substance, the divine being is one. There is one God, this infinite spirit that created the whole world, whose power is, is infinite, right? There's one spirit, and that, that one spirit is God. But we say that that God exists in three persons. Now, as we think of the persons, we've got to realize these are not bodily persons. OK, 
Okay, so we're not talking about three separate beings. Um, these are not bodily persons. They're not separate. They can all remain one because they're not, they're not separate bodies. They're one. And when we talk about the persons, there's an important concept, a couple important concepts to understand. But the first one is the idea of procession, procession. And the word procession, you know, if, if you just look at the word proceed, it means to go forth, pro and seed in Latin. It means to go forth, Very simple concept, right? So there are two processions, and this is taught by Thomas Aquinas in the Summa. So if we want to understand, like, you know, where do the persons come from? How do the persons exist? And so on. Um, we talk about the concept of procession, that the Son proceeds from the Father, and the Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. So there's this idea of procession that explains the relation between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Procession. And so when we think about procession, we say, what does that really mean, though? Like, if we say that the Son proceeds from the Father, and remember, when we're talking about the Trinity, um, let, let's not get confused with the incarnation of Christ. Let's Let's keep that separate, as it were, okay? Let's just talk about the Father, the Son, and the Spirit as they exist together in, in the divine person. Um, when we say that the Son, the Son of God, proceeds from the Father, well, what does that mean? Does it mean that there was a time when, when just the Father existed and then, you know, the son sort of had a spiritual birthday and, and he, was, he was born on a certain day. And the answer is no, that the, the son was never born. And the reason why the son was never born is because he's God. He, he's eternal. There was never a time where he did not exist. Now, you know, if, there's any, if there's any concept I think that's difficult to comprehend, it's God's eternity, right? God's eternity is very difficult to comprehend because when, when we think of generation or you know any kind of origin we think of a starting point and we think that before that the thing didn't exist and then came into existence if it was true that the sun didn't exist at some point then he wouldn't be god and so we've got to assume that the sun always existed he's eternal he is god he exists in god as uh, as the eternal infinite godhead but we say that the Son proceeds from the Father. And, and we have to ask, well, you know, what, what does that really mean? It doesn't mean that he was not existing and then came into existence. That's impossible because he's eternal. And so when we talk about this idea of procession, St. Thomas takes this question up and asks, what, what is it really? And he talks about a couple different ways in which the idea of procession uh, or the word procession is used. One way, when we talk about something proceeding from something else, we talk about moving from non-existence to existence. That, that's one way that the term procession can be used. But another sense in which the, the word can be used is simply by the, 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 the movement, as it were, of a thing to, to produce its likeness. Okay, We see this we see this in, in childbirth, in, in the birth of animals. We see a mother, pregnant, produces a, a new person, and they are similar. It's, it's the person's likeness, right? Thomas Aquinas explains, you know, the woman's body also produces hair, but hair is not considered procession or generation because the hair is not like the mother, whereas the child is like the mother. So, Procession is the, is, the, is the production, in some sense, of a second person that is like the first person. Now, again, when we think about mother and child or father and son, we normally think about two separate bodies. You know, the, the child is produced in the mother's body, then it's born, the umbilical cord is cut, and they become two separate persons and two separate bodies. But I think, it's, I think it's helpful to think about the, the child developing in the womb of the mother, even all the way until the time of delivery. Even after delivery, when the child is still joined to the mother, they are, they are one, one being, one body, and yet they're two persons. Right? We see that idea of procession. Before there's a separation of bodies, we see 
that there, that there is a procession, that that child being formed in the mother, in the mother's body, that child is like the mother, but is, is separate, is a separate person, and yet bears a resemblance to the mother. So that, that's the idea of procession. Now, again, I'm talking about bodies. So when we try to transfer that thought to God himself, there's no, there's no generation of bodies taking place. We're talking about a spirit. And so in, in Christian tradition, the explanation for this is that the procession that takes place is an intellectual procession, like the, like the development of an idea in our mind. It's an intellectual procession that essentially produces an intellectual person. Right? And, and there's a similitude because that intellectual person proceeds from the Father. The Son proceeds from the Father. And so they are like each other, and yet they remain united because the, the procession is an intellectual procession, and it remains in that spirit, which is God. It remains in God. So there's two persons, and yet they're consubstantial because the Son remains in the Father, and the Father in the Son. Jesus explains this in the Gospel. So we're not talking about the procession of another person in a body, which creates some confusion. We're talking about an intellectual being, which St. Thomas compares to the mind producing an idea. And that idea having similitude to the, to the, to the existing mind being in the mind of the mind, but in, in some way separate from it as a separate idea, as a separate person with respect to the Son of God. So if we remember that God is an intellectual being, the procession is intellectual. It's not the production and separation of a different body to create two gods. It's two persons remaining in one Godhead, and that's the procession of the Son from the Father. So now we've got two persons. We've got the Father and the Son. Uh, this this two-headed God, as it were, that is a spiritual or intellectual being that exists eternally and yet has procession. And now we come to the third person and we say, well, how does the Spirit relate to this? How does the Holy Spirit relate? And what the Christian Church teaches is that there is a second procession. So the Son proceeding from the Father is the first procession, and it's an intellectual procession. There is also a second procession, and that is a procession from both the Father and the Son. A second procession, but this is not an intellectual procession. This is a procession of the will. So the Son is, an, is a procession of intellect, in God. The Holy Spirit is a procession of will in God. And so there's a difference between the Father and the Son. There's a difference in the procession of the Son from the Father and the procession of the Spirit from the Father and the Son. The procession of the Son is an intellectual procession. The procession of the Spirit is a procession of the, of the will or volition, a volitional procession. Right now, if we think about if we think about intellect and will, it's, it's sort of interesting to think about because the perfection of the intellect is truth. The perfection of the intellect is truth. So, if we want to you know, evaluate the intellect, we, we we seek to know whether or not it's true. The, the perfection of the intellect is truth. The perfection of the will is goodness. So. What's interesting is that in these, two, in these two processions, one is really a procession of truth. And, and that's why in the New Testament, I think it's 1 Corinthians, St. Paul refers to Jesus as the wisdom of God. Jesus says, I am the truth, right? That's that, that idea of an intellectual uh, procession with intellect being, you know, uh, valued for truth. And then the spirit is, is, is represented as love because love or goodness, benevolence, is the perfection of the will. 
And so we can see how this relates to the attributes of God, what are called the personal attributes of God and so on. And this is where pantheism gets into trouble because pantheism doesn't recognize personality in God. It doesn't recognize these things. So it's very hard for a pantheist to explain the benevolence in the natural world, right? Where there appears to be a goodness or love in nature, whereas you know, a, a Christian doctrine of the personality of God actually provides and explains uh, all that. So anyway, we've got now a trinity of persons with the Son and the Spirit being processions from God that remain in God, just as ideas and the will remain in the soul, even though they proceed from the soul. We've got this, this notion of the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We see that the, the Son proceeds from the Father, and there is a likeness between them, because there's a procession, there's generation between the Father and the Son. The Son is begotten of the Father. The Son is, uh, I think it's better to say generated or or proceeding but but there's that idea of generation and in that idea of generation is similitude or likeness there's a likeness um, in the son as it proceeds from the father and because there's a likeness things tend to what they tend to love that which is like them think about the scene in the garden of eden where adam is with all of the animals and he's naming all of the animals, and he's naming them according to their, their qualities and things like that. But it says there's no, there's no creature suitable for man. There's nothing in the, in the natural world that was like man. And so God says, I will create a helper for him. And God creates the woman from the man. The, man, the woman proceeds or is generated from the man. And then when the woman is formed, Adam sees the woman and he, he's, he rejoices. He says, you know, this is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. This is like me. And you see that he's attracted to that creature which is like him. He loves that creature which is like him. And, and that's, the, that's the nature of love. We love that which is like ourselves. That's why a mother loves her own children. A father loves his own children and so on. They, we love that which is like us. We love people who are like us. We love people who share our beliefs, who share our culture, and so on. That's just natural. That's normal. We're, we're attracted to that which is like us. Well, because the Son proceeds from the Father and is like the Father, there is an attraction between the Father and the Son, and that attraction we might think of as the procession of the Spirit, which is love which is love between the Father and the Son, sort of an impulse or movement of, of the will towards the object uh, of what is willed. We see that that relationship exists between the Father and the Son. That's why when we read in the Gospels, Jesus talking about the Father, it's always about this love relationship between the Father and the Son. The Father loves the Son. The Son loves the Father. Um, that love existing between the Father and the Son, that love is... The, is, the, is the presence of the Holy Spirit. When God promises to give his spirit to human beings, what does he say is the perfection of a person who lives under the influence of that spirit? The, the, the perfection is that the person becomes loving, right? Love is the perfection of the Christian life. And so when we think about the Trinity, I just think that the main problem is caused by being uncomfortable with philosophical ideas and language because we don't study philosophy. Um, I think it's, it's bringing ideas of bodily things into contemplation of God, which causes personality to be equated with separate bodies. So we, we actually think that God is, is three separate um, three separate beings rather than one being consisting of three persons. Um, and so, so just being sloppy with the way we think about God, not beginning and grounding ourselves in the truth that God is an infinite spirit. He's a pure spirit, infinite, eternal, unchangeable, omnipresent, omnipotent, omniscient, on and on. Um, by not really starting there and constantly returning there, every time we think of something about God, every time we say something about God, returning to that fundamental 
knowledge that God is an infinite spirit. He is not a bodily creature. He is not in a certain place. He is not finite and so on. But he, he is an intellectual being. He is a spirit. And therefore, when we talk about we talk about the Son proceeding from the Father. We're talking about something intellectual. We're talking about something spiritual. We're not talking about anything material or physical, anything visible. It's not visible, not, not sensible in any way. There's this intellectual procession uh, of the Son from the Father. And then a second procession, a procession of will um, from the Father and the Son, which is the spirit of love. The, the, the Holy Spirit, which exists between the Father and the Son. And those three, Father, Son, and Spirit, three separate persons, to use a term, right, to use a term of person from human language, right, maybe, maybe it's not the best term, but to use that term to describe the nature of these three, th these three different ideas, as it were, right, Father, Son, and Spirit, uh, we use the term persons, but we can't confuse that with separate bodies, like like three men. Uh, we're talking about three divine persons in um, in the divine substance, which is which is uh, you know, which is an infinite spirit. So, when we clarify and, and distinguish those things, when we are careful to talk about God as a spiritual being, as an intellectual being. And the procession of the persons being an intellectual procession and a volitional procession or procession of the will. And then we think about the Trinity as spiritual persons that exist in a spiritual being. I think a lot of the confusion goes away. It, it's certainly foreign because, you know, we're, we're bodily creatures and it's difficult for us to, to think of things that are spiritual without immediately trying to make sense of them with our bodily senses like we immediately try to think about like what does it look like what does it sound like what does it feel like how much does it weigh where does it live and so we immediately try to think of everything in terms of bodily qualities but this is an infinite spirit and so it, it doesn't apply none of those none of those qualities apply We've got to consider it by means of contemplation as purely intellectual, purely spiritual. And so everything we say about God, everything we say about these persons and these processions and so on, it's invisible, it's infinite, it's eternal, it's intellectual, it's spiritual, and so on. So if we remember that God is spirit, then any talk of the Trinity is spiritual talk. Uh, I think that's that, that takes away some of the confusion and it eliminates the need for any goofy attempts to make some kind of illustration to show this or that because you're not you're not going to make a, a good illustration of bodily things. You're just not going to without sort of undermining the whole point that there is no separate body. I, I think if I was going to make a comparison if I was going to make a comparison, I think the comparison would be you know, using bodily things. I think the best comparison would be a pregnant mother with a child developing in her womb that's connected to her. So they're one, and yet they're two separate persons, but they're one. So you think about the formation of this, this, this second person proceeding from the first person. And then if you think of the attraction between the mother and that child, while they remain one, that attraction, then, you know, if, if we sort of personify that and give it a name, we would have these, because it's, it's something intellectual. You know, this is why you can't really use a bodily illustration. But if we were going to use a bodily illustration, I would, I would think that the best illustration would be a mother with a developing fetus because they're still one, and then the love between them, even though that's sort of a mixed, um, a mixed comparison of body and spirit, but but that's that's sort of the idea, except that it's all spiritual, right? It's all spiritual. So the son proceeds from the father as an intellectual procession, and then the spirit proceeds from the father and the son as a, as the will, uh, which which draws them together in love. 
And in that, in, the, in those three persons, and again, the, the use of the word persons is, is a little awkward, um, but we can understand that, that the, these are persons in as much as they have three distinct names, Father, Son, and Spirit. And, and the reason, you know, um, St. Thomas explains the reason why Son is an appropriate name for the second person is because he proceeds, he, he is generated from the Father in, in one way, where he, where something that is like the the the, the source is produced as as generation, even with people and animals. So it's it's proper to to to, to describe their relationship as Father and Son, because the nature of that procession is generative, and the likeness is produced. And the reason why the third person is called Spirit is because the procession which produces the spirit or which gives us the spirit is is a different kind of procession it's not it's not a, a like the father and the son it's different because it has to do with the will it is basically what what saint thomas called spiration or spiration and it, it leads to what is called the spirit so that's why the names of the three persons we don't have like father son and mother or father son and daughter because that third person doesn't have the same relation as as the first two persons of the Trinity. So, is it difficult? It's it's difficult, like any concept that requires study. But is is it this like incomprehensible, inexplicable mystery that we just blindly accept because the Church says so? Not if you go back and look at Church history. When we go back and look at Church history, we can see that there are very clear explanations provided in the church, you know, probably far clearer than what I communicated in this talk. But um, if you go back and read the Summa Theologica, you'll see that St. Thomas never throws his hands up in the air and, and plays like, you know, dopey, like, how do I know? Who am I to, to try to explain the Trinity? We, we don't find that attitude in St. Thomas. We find a clear, you know, step-by-step -step rational explanation of, of what we mean by the Trinity, what we mean by persons, what we mean by procession, and so on. So I recommend you take up uh, the Summa Theologica if you want to really dig into this, because St. Thomas explains this in detail. And uh, I think if you read St. Thomas uh, on, the, on the persons of the Godhead, um, I think it's... Uh, I think it's around question 27. I think that's where the, the, the section on the Trinity begins. I think that's where he starts talking about persons um, in, in part one of the Summa. Um, you can check me out. I, I might be wrong, but I think it's, I think it's question 27. Um, and you'll see he gets right into that. What are the persons? What is procession? Whether there is procession in God? what that procession is, uh, consists of, um, how procession differs between the Son and the Spirit, and so on. He explains all of that in good detail. So if you want to dig into it more, um, we don't have to play dumb. I don't, I don't know why Catholics do that. Um, it, it's, it has been clearly explained and demonstrated, this doctrine of the Trinity. That's why we have to believe it. Normally, when the Church proposes things to us by faith, it does so because they are proven. They are known to be true. They're demonstrated. Um, and yet they're unknown to you know, common Christian people. And so the church says, look, we as the, as, the, you know, as the magisterium tell you that there may be three or four different explanations for this idea, but this is the right one. And you need to trust us and, and believe this and confess this. But that doesn't mean you can't understand it. And that, that's, again, one, one of the mistakes in our thinking is that if the church asks us to believe something or call something a mystery, that it can't be understood. Um, when we talk about mysteries, we're normally talking about things that can't be understood by human reason alone. But once divine revelation brings light to those subjects, those mysteries are explained. And then Still, we have to work to, to study and reflect on those, uh, on, on revelation and, and put it all together. That's, that's the work of contemplation and study. We have to work to put it all together. But then we come to a point where we can understand and articulate things that were previously 
impossible to understand. So pretending that a mystery means it's just never going to be understood by anyone and we all just believe things ignorantly, um, that's really not how Christianity works. So if you want to get into the Trinity, like I said, go and read St. Thomas and you'll, you'll see the doctrine of the Trinity explained in its detail. We don't believe it just because the church says so. The church says so because it's true. That's why the church says so. And when we come to places where we don't understand what the church teaches, it's usually because we don't understand. We, we, don't, we don't think rightly about certain things. We have some, some faulty interpretation causing us to, to think about things uh, incorrectly. And we, we, we save ourselves by always trusting in what the church teaches as we continue to study and, and contemplate and pray and gain experience. And if we continue to do that, we come to understand why the church tells us to believe certain things, but we don't believe them just because the church says so. The church says so because they're true. We trust the church. We trust that the church will tell us to believe what is true, even when we don't understand it, but we continue studying and learning, and we come to understand that which the church presents to us initially by faith. So there is, you know, the, the, the union of faith and reason in the Catholic faith, but, but faith and reason, they, they work together. Some like to say faith comes first. That's really not true. It's a combination. It's, it's like a cyclical relationship between faith and reason. Some things we understand, and that helps us to believe other things, and then there are things we believe that help us to understand other things, and faith and reason just constantly work together to help us to grow in understanding. But I don't think it's, it's true or intelligent to, to say that we believe in the Trinity and act like there's no way to understand it. That, that's, that's, uh, that's not true. At least I don't think that's true. I don't think that the doctors of the church tell us that the Trinity is just some some crazy idea that we have to believe because the church says so. So anyway, I hope that's helpful at least to, to, get, your, to get your gears turning and to, to give you some, uh, some idea about, about what you can study to, to get a little deeper into the, the knowledge of this doctrine of the Trinity. But, but, but I really don't think it's smart for us to act like we believe something we don't understand because it's such an important doctrine. It's really the, the fundamental doctrine of the Christian faith. If you talk to Jews, you know, I've, 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 I've had debates and discussions with, with Jewish rabbis and teachers, and, you know, many Christians take it for granted, but the Trinity is the, the doctrine that, that a Jew looks at and just says, you know, yikes, like, how can you possibly accept this, this you know, polytheistic idea, this idolatrous idea of God? And, and, you know, we know that the Jews were God's people, that, that revelation, the scriptures were given to the, to the Jews. So, so personally, if, if the Jews disapprove of my religious beliefs, you know, I want to be able to explain why there's a difference. Because we know that, you know, like, like there's a passage in the gospel that says, we know that God spoke to Moses. But, you know, as for these Christian people, how, how do we know God spoke to them? You know, I, I'd like to be able to give an explanation for how we move from from Genesis to Abraham to Moses to you know to Christianity to the doctrine of the Holy Trinity, there better be an explanation because the Jews were first. So I, I don't think it's smart for us to to act like we, we believe things that that have no explanation or that are contrary to to any human reason. I think we have a responsibility to study to understand them so that we can articulate them and actually explain to a Jewish person how the doctrine of the Trinity in no way contradicts the Old Testament doctrine that God is one. We should be able to explain how both doctrines are true. And we can do that, and I believe that the Catholic Church has done that. So anyway, check out St. Thomas, his sections on, uh, on the Trinity, on the persons of God, on the procession of the Son and the Spirit. Um, and he explains everything pretty clearly. Um, I, I don't think you really need a whole lot of, of, of um, background knowledge to be able to read what he says about those things. He's pretty clear in his teaching. I think 
people who complain about St. Thomas being difficult to study, I, I, don't, I don't think they're really making an effort because he's not difficult to study. Um, so part one of the Summa, like I said, I think it's question 27. I think that's right. For some reason, that number is popping up in my head. So check, check around question 27 in part one, and you'll see him get into the Trinity, and uh, I think you'll find that helpful. So anyway, I, I, I hope you find this talk helpful. I hope it sort of sets you in a good direction that, that saves you some time in your studies and, and helps you to uh, make some progress on Trinity Sunday as we take some time to reflect on the Trinity. I hope that's helpful. God bless.